Now, to start us off with our um, with our keynote speaker today, we have Dr. Elaine Ingham from the Soil Food Web School, and she is here to talk more about those organisms in the soil. And with that, I will turn it over to her, Dr. Elaine Ingham, our fearless leader. Good day, everybody. Hope you've been having a good time at the Soil Summit, uh, listening to all these great talks by all the different speakers. Um, so today, I'm going to start out with a little bit more discussion about what is dirt and what is soil. So again, my favorite picture, looking at that soil in this field. Is this soil or is it dirt? And as I was suggesting yesterday, Organic matter and organisms are two very important parts in discerning whether this is dirt or this is soil. If it was soil, it wouldn't have a compaction layer. Your organisms will build that um, soil structure and it will not compact as long as you're treating it right. Now, you go in with some fertilizers or um, um, pesticides, uh, any of those um, toxic chemicals, and you're going to be killing the biology in the soil, and now you're starting to turn it into dirt. How fast can soil be turned into dirt? Well, every time you plow, every time you till up this soil, you're slicing and dicing and crushing the organisms that you need to maintain structure within the soil. So you can't be tilling. We want you to become no-till or uh, minimal till. You know, certainly if you have r rows out here, you can put a, f a furrow down the row for just a small space on the top of that bed. Or in the soil, you just have the furrow, and then you have um, a driving row or a walking row right next to that, and then you would have another furrow. So there's plenty of space for you to be putting in perennial, understory, ground cover kinds of plants. We don't want those plants to be growing more than just maybe a couple inches. Depending on what crop you're growing, you might want it pretty much flat to the ground. Or if you've got a, a um, crop plant that's pretty tall, you could let it be six, six inches. Depends on the precise crop that you're trying to grow. We want you to put in um, perennial low-growing plant species, cover plants, uh, or uh, ground cover, whatever you want to call them, that are perennial. And they will always be putting exudates out into the soil to keep your good organisms alive through the winter, perhaps, um, especially if you don't have a very difficult, um, you, the soil doesn't freeze at all, or freezes only once or twice. Those plants may well survive even a freeze or two before um, they succumb to the winter. Um, then they'll have to regrow from a crown um, come the next growing season. You don't have to keep buying seed if you're putting in a perennial plant. So you buy the mixture once. Maybe you see that one or two of those species of plants didn't make it through a winter, so you overseed with something else. It's not very long until you have the system, the soil completely covered. You know, so you put your start in, you're gonna do, um, do the furrow, um, drop your seed or drop your seedlings in, they start to grow and pretty soon they're up over your cover plants, shading those cover plants. You didn't have to go and find an herbicide to knock those cover plants down. You don't have to mow them and cross your fingers that you're going to be able to um, crimp the uh, nitrogen fixing plant that you added in with your mixture. Hope and pray that the vetch isn't gonna climb up on your, on your uh, crop plant and cause problems. So we need to start thinking about shifting away. And oh yeah, these are perennial plants. Emphasize that. You don't have to keep buying seed for them. So let's protect the soil surface from raindrops, one of the most compacting factor there is in agricultural production is rainfall from the sky. Because where that 
drop of water hits the ground, it's causing compaction typically somewhere around three inches deep into the soil, so four to, four to six inches. Um, so you have to deal with the compaction that's been produced by the fact that you don't have your soil covered. In the summertime, as water evaporates and it's pulled to the surface, bringing with it all of the soluble nutrients that might be in your soil, but when that water evaporates off into the atmosphere, those salts are left as a layer on the surface of your soil, and it's going to cause harm to, the, to your plants. High salt levels are deadly. Um, evidence, anybody who tries to drink salt water um, when they're out on the ocean will surely die. So we want to be aware of all of these factors so you understand, is this soil or is this dirt? Well, look at the beneficial organisms that occur in healthy soils. And so we talked about them. We talked more about the function yesterday than you know, particular aspects of the beneficial organisms. But again, we're, we're talking about this food web and where do these organisms fit in dirt? Um, what do you have present in soil? So hopefully from yesterday, you understand that these organisms are, of course, you know, you've got to have your plants, you have to have your dead organic material. So the residues that fall to the surface of the soil, you will, you see that layer and you want that layer to decompose quite rapidly so that the fungi are doing, you know that the fungi are doing their job. So one of the things I forgot to mention yesterday were the mycorrhizal fungi here. And we'll be looking at some of those today. How do you identify those? How do you make it easy for you to figure those particular um, colonization in the root systems? How can you measure that? So looking at that interaction between plants and mycorrhizal fungi. So fungi, the um, bacteria and the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods, the higher level predators, which someday we will get around to expanding the, those groups and learning even more about how this below ground system works. So what's the difference? We've talked about soil, where that mineral component, the sand, the silt, the clay, where does sand, silt, and clay come from? Well, it comes from the rocks, from the pebbles, from the gravel. And how does that rock material get broken down and turned into those different size materials, the sand, the silt, clay? You know, so the clay, I'm going to go over here to the dirt, because dirt is just the mineral component. It is just the sand, silt, and clay. So as the rocks and the pebbles and the boulders and the parent material break down, what's released are those real small clay platelets, and they bind together and cause those clay particles, which are about the same size as bacteria. So about one micrometer diameter, one micrometer thick. So they look very much like bacteria. You have to show you those differences between clays and bacteria so you can count those um, bacteria reliably. Silt is quite a bit larger than clay. Um, so silt is you know, um, too small for you to see with your eyes. But um, you could, if you could see really finely, you could probably pick it up in uh, forceps. Um, they're the size, the silt is the size of um, red blood cells, for example. Sand, you can typically see sand with your eyes. So you could definitely pick up sand particles with a pair of forceps or a pair of tweezers. Um, all of these contain nutrients. In the multi-layers of the silica in these compounds, in the sand silk clays, and of course in the rocks and pebbles and, and material, parent material, um, there is a lot of nutrient being held, sequestered, in that the layers of the silica materials, uh, you have lots of nutrients. How is your plant going to get those nutrients out of the soil or out of the sand, silt, and clay? Well, not going to happen in dirt. 
because the organisms that do that work of pulling the nutrients, the mineral nutrients, out of the, these materials aren't present in dirt because there's no food to feed those organisms. We have to start getting organic matter back into the system for us to start to call it soil. So the mineral component, yes, sandstone clay, the texture, now texture is not so soil. Texture is a part of what soil is, but definitely not the whole thing. So dirt, sorry, not soil. So we have to have the mineral component and organic matter in order to feed the bacteria and fungi and have these bacteria and fungi perform their functions. And we were talking about those functions yesterday, the overarching principles that are supplied when you have these aerobic organisms present in the system. Now, this particular definition of soil comes from Hans Jenny, one of the fathers of soil science. He assumed that everybody understood that soil is aerobic, that soil has to have the air passageways and hallways, the um, pores, the structure to hold water, to allow oxygen to move into the soil, allow your organisms to move in there, and oh yeah, allow water to infiltrate and be held deeper down in the soil. So that's what we mean when we say building soil structure. We have to have adequate organic matter. Well, how much is enough? The minimum level to get the benefits of growing things in soil is 3% organic matter. You have less than that, and it's awfully hard to keep your organisms alive and active and functioning throughout that whole growth period. So we need the aerobic organisms, the air organic matter, and the mineral component in order to have this be soil. Should we have more than 3% organic matter? Absolutely. Um, I don't know any plant material that is not benefited and, and life is made easier for you as a grower if you, ha don't, if we, if you have higher organic matter in the system. So 5%, absolutely, keep going. 10%, 20, 30. My favorite soil is made from the organic matter alone with the aerob aerobic organisms in there. Because when you think of organic matter, where did that organic matter originally come from? It's dead plant material. Are there any nutrients in that dead plant material? Well, of course there is. It was a plant once upon a time. That means that plant tissue had to have all the nutrients present in it that any plant requires in order to be able to perform the functions of being a plant. So of course there are nutrients in the organic matter. I know people will say, oh, but there's so much carbon. Well, not any more than a plant. And these microorganisms love to grow on the surfaces of your plant material, protecting your plant against diseases and pests and problem organisms. So of course it's got the nutrients. Your plant material, um, residues on the surface of the soil, the dead root systems that after that plant can't make it anymore, though that root system is going to become organic matter as well. The aerobic organisms, they need to be around, and if you have killed all of them on your property, you're going to have to go out and find some more someplace and either buy really good compost or start making it yourself if none's available. So when we look at the nutrients in soil, and now this is an excerpt, from Sparks 2003, so you know, I'm, it's a little bit different from what he presented. Um, removed some extraneous material that um, didn't need in here. So, but we're looking at the elements. So, oxygen, silica, aluminum, iron. You know, uh, here's calcium, magnesium, uh, sodium, manganese, zinc. Here's copper. Here's nitrogen. Here's phosphorus, and here's sulfur. So when we look at the total, so this soil, the concentration of these elements or minerals in your soil, 
and the median, the on average in general um, value for these organisms from soils from all over the planet. You can see there is no nutrient that we lack in soil. How much calcium does your plant require, for example? Well, what's in one kilogram of your soil is 15,000 milligrams of calcium. This would last your plant if it could just suck that uh, material out of the soil through the whole entire growing season. This 15,000 milligrams per kilogram of calcium would probably last you for something like 70 years. And remember, every second of every day, the rocks, the pebbles, the boulders, the parent material boulders uh, are all being broken down every day by bacteria and fungi. So the weathering of rocks is not the most important thing. It is the action of the organic acids, the materials that bacteria and fungi make that causes these larger chunks of rock to break down eventually. So until the day you run out of sand, sail, clay, rocks, pebbles, parent material, and boulders, you don't have to worry about nutrients. It's already in your soil. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. So why are we putting in organic fertilizers out? Well, if you kill the organisms in your soil, then you have to use those chemicals. So we have the nutrients that we need. We don't have to be worried about that. We just have to be worried about whether we have the biology to get things started. Now, so after 70 years, you know, you, if you didn't have more sand, silt, and clay joining the fray, you might have to start worrying. So what else holds nutrients? Uh, yeah, organic matter. So let's count on both of them. So um, look down here at nitrogen. On average, in general, 2,000 milligrams per kilogram. That's way more than any crop requires. And we've got something on the order of, you know, um, 50, maybe, well, depends on exactly what's going on. But you've got plenty of nitrogen. You've got plenty of phosphorus. You've got plenty of sulfur. So you don't need those inorganic fertilizers. And we're going to be putting a whole lot more of the organic material into the soil. So nutrients will come from the organic matter as well. If we have those low growing cover plants, the ground cover, those plants will make certain all this nutrient cycling is happening. We get the root systems of those low growing plants covered with the mycorrhizal fungi that your plant requires. Then the instant you put the seed into the soil and the seed starts germinating, it's going to be connected into the below ground network that the mycorrhizal fungi establish. Every single plant in that field that can become mycorrhizal will be healthy. And that's what we want to make certain is happening for all the crops that you're growing. So how are, they, how are these nutrients in plant available forms? How do you make them plant available? How does that conversion happen? And we talked about that yesterday, so I don't think we have to go over it. So again, all of the organisms in the soil, we've got to continue to think about those. And so I'm going to go through pictures. How do you identify some of these? Just to start giving you a clue of the kinds of things you're going to be introduced to in order that you can be doing this work for yourself. You can do this work for your neighbors, for your friends as well. And so we train people how to identify, is this a good guy fungus or is this a bad guy fungus? Well, just by looking at a block of this soil, just cut, that, cut it out using a, a shovel and kind of cleaned up the surface here so you could see clearly where that white fungal hyphae is growing in here. Yeah, it's kind of lined up with the woody material, with the um, 
uh, you know, broken up parts of woody materials that were added into this block of material. Um, you can see where that woody material has been broken down and it looks like soil. Good structure, lots of airways and passageways in here. So excellent structure. You can take some of this soil out and look at what the biology is in that material. So when we're looking at something like this, we will find fungi. Of course you're going to find fungi because look at the massive amount of fungal biomass you have in this material. Um, so fungal hyphae, we teach you the characteristics of fungal hyphae, uniform diameter all the way along the strand. You may have changes in diameter when it branches. But yeah, there we are, some more of that particular fungus. You can see septa, these are cross walls, but these are adventitious septa. They only happen on occasion. They are not uniform. So in general, those fungi that have uniform distances between their septa are more likely to be beneficial. But um, you know, this guy is probably still beneficial even though it lacks one of those characteristics. Well, what are the other characteristics? Color. Typically, color means, um, the, the darker the color, means the more likelihood that this is gonna be a beneficial fungus. Now, look out, we have a few disease-causing organisms in this group of fungi, but um, those distinguishing characteristics can very easily be given to you. So we have another strand of hyphae down here in the bottom left-hand corner. You can see a slightly narrower diameter, so still wider than three micrometers. Um, brown, tannish, so it's, it's, um, it, it is colored. So most likely this is a beneficial fungus. I can't see whether it has septa in a row or whether it's adventitious again. These individuals right here, these strands, are they the same fungal hypha as this? Or is it a different species? Well, it doesn't look like it's even uniform diameter all the way along, but it is. If you use your focus knob and you've got to focus all the way along, bring the edges into nice sharp focus like they are right here in order to be able to tell whether it's uniform diameter all the way along. So we have another fungal hypha right here. You can see it's clear, it's colorless. That's not quite such as good, so much of, of a good indicator, but look at the wide diameter. So wide diameter is better, colored is better, but when you're mixing and matching some of these characteristics, um, it still can be beneficial. So the wide diameter beats the clear or colorless condition. So we have um, testate amoeba way out of focus right here. There's lots of other creatures, um, lots of bacteria in this picture. There's uh, several um, hundred thousand bacteria in this area right alone, it's hard to count. So we would choose to dilute more when we go, get to the stage of trying to count the bacteria in this um, sample. It's just so chock full of really good things that you know this is going to make a great um, potty mix for your plants. They are going to adore this. The biggest problem with a lot of organic matter in pots or in your, in your soil is that so many people have the overwhelming urge to overwater. This kind of organic matter, this really well-structured material, has a huge water holding capacity. So it can be holding something, something like 10 to 20 times its weight in water. That's how well-structured this material is. So, there is a disease-causing fungus in here, and the way we figure that out is it's very narrow diameter, it's clear colorless, it doesn't have any septa. You wanna worry about those guys. So there's an example right here of those of um, a fungal hypha. 
that is uh, probably a pathogen. We plated this material out in a Petri dish because we knew that none of these other fungi even had a chance to be able to grow on that Petri dish. Those conditions are completely wrong, completely the opposite of what is needed to grow these fungi. Fungi are obligate aerobes. For the most part, the filamentous fungi are going to be obligate aerobes. This particular fungus is Pythium. It is um, one of those disease-causing fungi. And so when you put it on a plate with a lot of the foods that it requires, it starts growing very, very rapidly. And because you've put a lid on that plate, oxygen can't get into the plate. And this fungus is going to have a grand old time growing and taking over your whole entire plate. So you start talking to somebody who does this kind of testing, and they show you the Petri dish with that massive white fuzzy wuzzy stuff inside and they go, oh, you look at all of the disease causing fungus you've got. This is just gonna take out all of your plants. You better get out there now and put a an, uh, fungicide to prevent the growth of these fungi. And what is it that you actually kill? It's not the disease causing fungus. It's all the good guys. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy that is absolutely and completely and totally wrong. If you had not applied the fungicide and not killed all these beneficial organisms, that pythium would never have had a chance. I have potted plants in this kind of soil over and over and over and over again, and I have never lost any of those plants to the pythium taken over. Because the pythium is going to be outcompeted, it's going to be consumed by one of the beneficial predators in the system, and, it, and it's going to uh, be attacked by or dealt with by inhibitory compounds made by some of these organisms. But in the soil, antibiotics, these inhibitory compounds, are not released out into the whole soil. They don't cause mass sterilization. Those inhibitory compounds are only released right around the body of those bacteria or of those fungi. So you will be able to reduce the population, but you need all those other interactions to really control something and prevent that pythium from being able to grow. So let's keep going. This is a root system of an onion, and you can see the autofluorescent arbuscules formed by the endomycorrhizal fungus, or more commonly has been told, um, called vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, so VAM. The arbuscule is where the exchange between the plant and the fungus occurs. So the plant is happily making all kinds of photosynthate. The photosynthate comes down into the root system where it's colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi. The plant gives that mycorrhizal fungus some food, along with a message basically published in uh, biochemistry given a message that the plant needs whatever the plant needs. So let's say it's calcium. So the uh, plant is um, telling the fungus to go find some uh, calcium, and the fungus is more than happy to do that. So you can see some of the hyphae out here where that fungal hypha is going to grow out into the soil way over here and find some calcium use its um, enzymes to pull that calcium out of the sand, silk, clay, rocks, pebbles, out of the organic matter, and translocate that back to that arbuscule. And the fungus now says, hey, plant, I've got your calcium. I'll trade you that for some more of those great um, sugars you were feeding me, or proteins, or amino acids. And so both organisms benefit. And of course, then what's the plant going to do? 
Well, if you want more of this food, then you have to go find me some water and, and I need some phosphorus. And gee, while you're out there, I want a little bit of sodium. And the fungus says, yeah, no problem. There was plenty of that out there. And so back through the hypha goes the message. Here's what the plant wants, transport it to the plant. Here in the, through the arbuscule, the exchange occurs. Why the vesicular arbuscular and mycorrhizal fungus makes that autofluorescent compound, nobody really knows. No one's looked at the metabolism of, of endomycorrhizal um, plant species or fungi to figure out why. But this only occurs when the plant and the fungus are interacting together. So it's these interactions that are really important for us. How, can you estimate how much of this root system is actually colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi in this picture? So if you add up all of the places that are dark, no fluorescence, there's another little patch, there's another little patch that's not fluorescing, another little one there. And now compare those areas that are colonized by the mycorrhizal fungus. What's the percentage? Now you can get this, you know, you can have a little uh, ruler that you can use um, in your eyepiece. And, and so you can get a, a fairly good idea of how much of the root system is colonized and how much isn't. So when I look at this amount that's colonized, I would say that there's about 40% of the total that is colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi. We know on work that was done by um, folks at Colorado State University, John Moore, um, they've showed that as long as you have 12%, more than 12% of the root system colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi, that you will be receiving, your plant will be receiving benefit from being colonized by that mycorrhizal fungus. But, you know, can you get more? Yeah. If you can get your root system colonized 40%, then you will get all of the benefits that that mycorrhizal fungus can give. Obviously, they're pulling nutrients from the soil and bringing them to the plant so the plant will grow better, so the mycorrhizal fungus will grow better. We also know that the mycorrhizal fungi will translocate water. And so in a drought period, you need to have your plants colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi so that the fungi can grow the root, grow the fungal hyphae down 10, 20, 30 more feet. We know that the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi can extend out for 300 yards. That research has been done and published. There's others saying the length of a football field. So how deep into the soil can the mycorrhizal fungi go? Well, it's going to increase the amount of water that your plant can obtain in a dry, droughty summer period. So your plant survives. It produces um, yield, and you as a grower are going to have some money in the bank. So we really want these mycorrhizal fungi in the proper plants. Ectomycorrhizal fungi are colonized, uh, uh, colonize the root systems of evergreens, conifers. The um, endomycorrhizal fungi colonize everything from, through the deciduous trees, deciduous shrubs, uh, through the highly productive grasses, um, the um, tomatoes, the solanaceae, uh, through the onions, the garlics, most of our veggie materials require mycorrhizal colonization. But then that set of uh, plant species that should not become colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, the coal, the kale crops, you know, things like broccoli, cauliflower, uh, mustards. So as long as you're paying attention, you can make sure that your low-growing ground cover has the right kind of mycorrhizal fungus in the soil. Moving on. When we're looking in here for a flagellate, it's really easy to figure him out because he's larger by significant amount than any of the bacteria. There's a flagellum right here, and you do want to be looking for those little flagella 
wiggling around in the soil, um, pushing the uh, flagellate through the soil. When you see the other fungal, uh, the other flagellate, um, when you see the other flagellum of this flagellate, and that's right here, it is wrapped around the body of this flagellate. And so as this flagellate is moving through the soil, pushing along, this flagellate will bumble on one side. He'll be pulled to one side because of this front fl flagellum being wrapped around the body. And so we use this characteristic of the flagellate going through the, um, through the soil solution and it does a sidewards tumble. And then again, sidewards tumble. So we're looking for that kind of distinctive um, motility. And then you know that that's a flagellate, not just a small ciliate. When I look at this particular picture, this has got me worried because looking at how poor structure in the aggregates that the bacteria are building. This is not good. This is not a healthy soil. Despite the fact that we are seeing a good guy, they're not there in large numbers. So you start to look at everything that's going on in these pictures and those interpretations tell you something. So when you're looking at this picture, what would you say about the aggregate condition in this soil? Not at all. They're about the only aggregate you can find is this little one right there. And boy, this is, this is not good looking. Now, we have an active amoeba. And it grows. You can see the clear tip right here. That pseudopod moves out first. And then the rest of the body will come along. See all the little dots in there? Don't they look exactly like the dots out here where all of these bacteria are hanging out? Yeah, because these amoebae eat bacteria. And so there they are. They're, they've got to eat 10,000 a day in order to stay alive and hat, fat and happy. So she's happily chowing down, moving through the soil solution, eating every single bacterium that it likes going through. You can see another amoeba. It's a little, it's a different species. You can see this little tip that it's pushing out and that's very characteristic of that species of amoeba. You can see here cysts of the amoeba. They're always double-walled. And so the outer layer of that cyst is ornamented. When you look at this one, same species, ornamented outside. Not drastically ornamented, but definitely has a pattern, has a... Um, a bit of a, you know, kind of scallop to the outside. Okay, now how about this? Is, is, that, a, is that one of those guys? No, because it's not double-walled. It's only single-walled. Um, lots of stuff inside. Is it an amoeba that's just kind of, you know, got a little tired, decided to take a little nap. So you stand and, and you watch this for 30 seconds. And you know, then suddenly you notice, oh, it's got a flagellum. This is a flagellate. It just decided to take a nap for a while. Just because they're not moving doesn't mean they're dead. So sometimes you got to kind of poke them. So beneficial nematodes, um, we teach you the characteristics, again, of uh, what the bacterial feeders look like. They all have mouths like this, sometimes kind of wide, um, V-shaped stomas, sometimes cylindrical stomas. We'll be looking for median bulbs and terminal bulbs, and we teach you what the characteristics are for each group of nematode. So when we look at nutrient cycling, we've now talked about nutrient cycling in the soil food web where the bacteria and fungi are eaten by their predators. We've talked about mycorrhizal colonization where the mycorrhizal fungi are told to go get the nutrients that the plant requires and bring them back in exchange for more um, food. But there's this new way that people have just started talking about called rhizophagy, where the plant is attracting bacteria to the root tip. And it, the plant lures those bacteria inside that root tip. So the, the um, 
a plant takes an oxidizing agent, like bleach, the, the microbial version of bleach, and bleaches its root tips so those bacteria can move in to the plant root, just right there at the tip. And once all those bacteria have kind of gathered in that nice, safe place, the plant sends out a wave, uh, another wave of oxidizing material, and basically just completely decomposes the cell wall of those bacteria, which causes the bacteria to leak cytoplasm out of their bodies and into the plant sap. Kind of a clever way of doing that, getting extra nutrients by inviting these sweet, innocent, unsuspecting bacteria to come into the root system and then grabbing a lot of the nutrients away from those bacteria. Well, so the end of the root tip of the plant is now closed off. Those bacteria follow the outer edges of the plant until they get to the root hairs that have started to develop. And apparently there's an escape exit right there where the root hairs start. So all those bacteria file out and they then start growing on the, um, taking up nutrients that are in the soil, regrowing uh, their cell wall, and they go around back through the roots and hang out and wait until the roller coaster opens up again. And in the bacteria go, the plant then strips them of their membranes, lose a lot of their um, nutrients into the plant sap, and then the bacteria move back around and go, it's kind of like me with a roller coaster. Again, again, I want to go again. And they just seem to do that. And interesting, um, only been brought to light in the last, I suppose, you know, four or five years. So really interesting. There's yet another way for microorganisms to benefit that plant. And isn't it important to know that? So now, instead of just being the one mycorrhizal colonization, then we discovered that the soil food web and nutrient cycling and now rhizophagy. How many things have we not yet figured out? So we've talked about all the benefits of a well-balanced food web. We've talked as well about our own health. You know, we're healthy when we have the organisms in the soil helping our plants. We eat those organisms. And when we re-inoculate our digestive system, and it increases our health. So have a good day listening to all of the, um, the uh, talks scheduled for today. And I'll see you back again tomorrow. <music>